Hi everyone, I'm Luciano and I'm a principal data science a scientist at PyMC Labs and core maintainer of the PyMC probabilistic programming language. And today I'm going to talk to you about probabilistic programming and why we need it in business settings. So I'll talk to you about something that's a really common problem in all of business, is you have to make decisions based on the noisy data that you have available. And this means that you have to reason and make decisions in the face of uncertainty. So just to make your examples concrete, you could have to pick which advertisement campaign to use, how to distribute your marketing budget across different media channels. You could say you could want to predict if your product will be effective in the market or not, or how will demand change in the next quarter, for example, if you want to plan inventory or a supply chain. And all of the decisions have to take into account the variability that is inherent to the data. And they should be based on business logic. So what's the expected uplift if you if you do um, if you choose to deploy one advertisement instead of the other, or what's the expected loss if you miss a shipment of, of um, equipment or you plan your inventory incorrectly. And us at PyMC Labs, we help companies make decisions based on their data, and we work mostly in the fields of pharma and marketing. Since I can't really talk to you about what we do specifically with our clients, I'll focus on a really common marketing problem throughout the talk, which are A-B tests. So it's something that really permeates all business. So what are A-B tests? The overall goal of an A-B test is that you have two variants of the product that you want to show, and you don't really know which one will perform better, and you want to learn which one will perform better. And I'm being very vague on purpose because this is, uh, this can apply to basically every if every business. Um, you could have, for example, a website layouts, and you want to see which one leads to more clicks, or advertisement layouts, which one leads more clicks, uh, or for example, uh, or, or purchases, or you could have to choose what's the thumbnail to put on a video, which leads to more views, or uh, more concretely, you could have a toy and you want to see which color to make the toy to lead to more purchases in a target audience. So how are these A-B tests done? Essentially, you grab uh, from, from all of your customer space, or you, you grab a, a test group, and you split it into two uh, subgroups. One that you'll show the variant A, and the other one you'll show the variant B. And each of these will then uh, be measured if they perform or not desired action. So again, very vague, because what the variants are depends on the business. What's the de desired action depends on the business too. So for example, it could be to buy a product, to click on a place on the website, to view a video, whatever. So, Again, the core things, two variants, you then want to see which one leads to more uh, of a desired action. So after you finish the A-B test, the actual things that you do know are the audience sizes for each of the groups. And then uh, so after these, these test groups, how you were split, and then how many subjects went into each. And then you have the number of desired actions that were performed by each of the groups and we'll call these conversions. If you were to repeat the experiment for a second time, or a third, or whatever, maybe the number of participants might be the same, because you might choose this to stop the experiment once you get to exactly the same number of participants. Uh, but the number of conversions might be different, and it's very likely that it, it will be different, because every person is different, and so their behavior will be Potentially different from each other, and this will induce variability in the observations. So when you try to do anything of a, a decision afterwards, you have to take into account this sort of variability. You can't just roll out by saying, yeah, I do the conversion ratio of my noisy observations and just trust that this will hold. Because what you wanted to learn from this noisy data was, how likely it is that a potential future customer will convert or will do the desired action. And you don't have that 
out of the box with these two things that you measured, the audience size and the number of desired actions. So how do you get this thing that you want to learn? Um, and I'll talk to one of the ways, talk to you about one of the ways, which is to use pluralistic programming. And um, I'll introduce what it is and why it helps us to do this. So pluralistic programming is a, pri a, pluralist, uh, a priority programming paradigm. And there are many pluralistic programming languages, PPLs for short. And high, at high level, the main thing that they provide is a way for the users to specify some random process that is assumed to generate your observations. So this essentially means that you incorporate the variability in the observations and you say something generated these observations that can be variable, noisy, a bit random. But I assume that it was due to this sort of structure. So it might have been something like there's a property of variant A, there's a property of variant B, we could call it conversion rate. This is something that is uh, some property that we don't know the value of, but when we show it to people, people will convert with some probability uh, and that's only dependent on this sort of property. And we want to try to learn what this sort of unknown property of the variant is. And you could know a priori something of this property. So if you, again, we call this thing a conversion rate that's intrinsic to the variant, you could say from previous experiments, we know that uh, conversion rates are really low. So my, my business and expert knowledge of the generation process is that this conversion rate can't be 100%, it should be below 20. And you have these PPLs are able to incorporate this sort of prior and expert knowledge. And then the most important thing after you explicitly specify how you assume you generate these observations and encode the prior knowledge is that they can backtrack this sort of generative process from the observations, which are the things that you know, onto these, pro uh, these properties of variants or whatever it is that you assume uh, were conditioning your observations. And um, this process of learning the unobserved model parameters from the observed is called inference. And the way in which this inference occurs also is able to be aware of the uncertainty of the, of the quantities. So it might be that you say, okay, I don't really know for sure which is the parameter value of the conversion rate for one of the variants. I think, or I believe it's between these values is, for example, 0 0.5 and 0 point, uh, 0 0.05 or 5% probability of conversion and 7% of probability of conversion. Um, I'm fairly certain about that. And you can quantify that uncertainty in a way uh, with these PPLs. Um, why do we actually care? Why would we ever need the PPL? Aren't there things that already work that are used in regular statistics that can be used to apply to, to work on the problems? The answer is that most of the techniques in regular stats are usually applied in business settings, but they don't provide the flexibility that is required in many of the business scenarios. So for example, if you have, um, some temporal structure inside of the data generation process or cohorts of subjects that behave similarly to each other uh, or you have nested structures inside of this data generation that conditions your observations or you have for example missing data which is very common in pharma so so if you do clinical trials there's something called survival analysis and you track subjects for some period of time and then after this period of time you don't really know how they continue evolving and so essentially you have this missing portion of the data. So, and you have to make decisions based on this. Um, when you want to incorporate all of these things and all of these complexities, then the normal techniques are too rigid to account for this. And PPLs are flexible enough to express all of these and then run this sort of automatic, automatic inference. There are many tools out there that you can use out of the box in business settings. And we'll be talking about PyMC, which is one of the probabilistic programming languages in Python. 
there are many others. So, for example, Turing in Julia, MC, Pyro, Tensor for Probability, Edward, Stan, and, and a bunch more. So it doesn't make sense to list them all. I'm just listing a bunch. But we'll be writing our example here with Python. Um, and going back to the concrete, essentially, in our A-B test scenario, we will be assuming that each variant has some unknown conversion rate, and that's a property of the variant that we're showing. And the number of conversions depends on this probability of conversion. That's a property of the variant. So the things that we do observe that we usually will label K, the number of conversions might follow some distribution, some probability distribution, and we'll be choosing a binomial distribution uh, that has a probability of of a success in the binomial p that's the conversion rate and the number of people that actually went into the audience that were exposed to one of the variants and you can encode the the the, the prior expert knowledge that you have on the conversion probability into something that's called the prior so these are latent things you don't really observe but you say a priori this is this might be distributed according to some beta distribution that might skew uh, or, or make an ununiform uh, assumption on what's the conversion rate up priori. And learning the unknown parameters can be done and we'll be using Bayes inference. And why we'll be using Bayes inference and why is it good? It's because you can naturally encode the uncertainty in the unobserved model parameters and it can be applied to most model structures thanks to really flexible algorithms that are now available in most PPLs. You can express almost any sort of conditional dependence of your observations on latent parameters, and then you can run these sort of multi-purpose inference algorithms that will just learn this sort of thing. And the key result also of these inference is that they quantify the uncertainty of what you learn. As what I said before, you can learn, okay, the conversion rate is, I believe it's between five and 7%. And I believe that it's very likely that on average, it should be six or something like that. And you have this sort of measure of how likely it is that it will be one or the other value of probability. And this uncertainty can then be used to drive database decisions that are aware, aware of the uncertainty. So now in the, we'll be exploring a very simple A-B test sample in which this is all fake data and uh, it will be available. It's all available on the, on the repo on GitHub that you can just copy the code over and look into it. Uh, essentially there's two variants. I chose to call them one and two. And there's a total number of customers that are exposed to the old variant, the total number of customers that are exposed to the new variant. You get some total number of conversions according to the old and to the new. And finally, if you were to compute the ratio of the conversion, so how many of the people that were exposed to the new variant actually converted, you would get something like that. And you see that they're fairly similar. And based on this number, which should you choose to use or deploy? That's Or which one do you expect to be best behaving? And so how do you do that? Or how do you write this sort of probabilistic model in Pine C? And you see it's fairly simple. The first thing is that you say we'll be defining a generative process, a model, and we'll be using two conversion rates that will be a priori beta, beta distributed, one for variant one, one for variant two. And then we'll have observed conversions for variant one and observed conversions for variant two that will depend on these unknown and unobserved properties of the variants p1 and p2 and total conversions will depend also on the number of people that were exposed to each of the video variants and we have the observed quantity for uh, uh, the conversions of the variant one and the variant two you can also add in any sort of uh, other metric or other quantity that could be of importance for making a decision afterwards like for example you could inform the conversion difference so what's the probability uh, what, how, what's the difference between the conversion rate of the new variant and the old variant 
or what's the improvement percentage that the new variant has with respect to the old variant. And once you've written down the entire data generation process, you can do base inference automatically by just saying, I want to sample from this, and this will go through a process that's called Markov chain on the Carlo and use a bunch of fancy algorithms to learn a posterior distribution on the belief on each of the conversions. And you can then visualize this process. And maybe you don't really want to make a decision based on the conversion of A or a conversion of B. Maybe the, the stakeholders want to make a decision based on what you expect the conversion difference to be. So for example, you could plot the posterior or the conversion difference and say, okay, what's how likely it is for me to get an increase in my conversions if I switch? And you can compute this sort of probability based on what you learn, and you see that's 74.5% uh, that from the data that you have available, you will get more conversions using the new variant. And um, but you have 25.6% probability that you'll get less variants, uh, less conversions. So fairly, it's kind of similar, and this shouldn't be confused with frequent statistics p-values. This is something completely different. It's like measuring the effect size of uh, uh, treatment. So this is telling you with 74.5% I believe uh, priority, I believe that will have an increase in conversions. And you can also compute this maybe the stakeholders don't really care about this absolute difference. Maybe they care about re relative improvement. So the improvement percentage, and you can also crop this. Maybe the stakeholders can say, I, if we get the conversions that are between uh, an improvement that's between minus three and 3%, we don't really care. It means that the two variants are performing exactly the same. So this is a region of practical equivalent between the variants. And you can measure how likely it is that the two variants are inside, are practically equivalent. And you get really high probability almost 40 percent and actually there's also priority mass that there's uh, a decrease so a significant decrease in conversions by switching to the new variant so what should you do again so uh, to make things even easier for stakeholders you can then incorporate business logic into this and incorporate for example what's the probability that they'll lose money or what's the cost benefit ratio if i deploy one variant versus the other, these two cost-benefit ratios could be different. And then you could compute the uh, loss or the risk of, of changing or, or losing money. Or you could actually compute other metrics like uh, what's the expected uplift. So if the new variant performs better than the old variant, how much money do I expect to make? Or you could compute your expected loss. So if variant the new variant is worse than the old variant, how much money do I expect to lose? And you can put all of this together and see that your optimal decision, if the cost benefit ratio is asymmetric, so something like the new variant is for some reason a bit more costly than the old one, the optimal choice from the business perspective is to not switch, even though you had some increased in, some increased conversions. Uh, they're not worth switching because you have an expected loss that's higher than your expected uplift. So that would seem to be very nice, and that's a simple example, but A-B tests are not as simple as they seem, and they actually are quite complicated when you start to incorporate all of the things that generate the data. So for example, A-B tests are carried out for a period of time, so they could show temporal structure, they could show trends, they could show seasonality, Seasonality in, in the sense of something that changes between weekdays and weekends or, or even months. They could be context dependent. So if you're doing an A-B test during spring, it could show differences. If you do the A-B test during winter, your, the subjects involved could be belong to different cohorts. They could have the behaviors that are different between each other. You could have unbalanced cohorts when you look into these things. At, at a stratified level of time periods or contexts. And, and for example, your measure quantity might not even be binary. It could be how long a video, uh, video is watched, how many items are per purchased by each subject. And with these things that deviate from just counts, your observations might actually be skewed. They could be zero inflated. 
So with all of these sort of problems, PPLs, progressive programming, are a very good way because they're flexible enough to incorporate all of this, pro uh, all of these into the data generation process, and the inference step is essentially unchanged. So what I'll do is show you that in the data that I generated, the fake one, there's temporal structure. And essentially, you see peaks in, in uh, the visits of this sort of like traffic, uh, people that are exposed to each of the variants, and the peaks correspond to weekends. And there seems to be some difference in conversions during weekends with respect to week business days. So, so you can, can you still use PPLs? Of course, and inference is more or less the same. But the user's work is to specify this new generative model. And essentially what I choose is to say that the conversion rates might be different if you're working on a business day or on a weekend. And then you just map those to the probability of converting for each time or each day in which you perform the measure of conversions. So now you have two unknowns for conversion rates. And you have observations that are distributed over time. And then you have essentially exactly the same step of inference, nothing changes. And you can then plot the posteriors that you learn from the conversion difference. And things might be different now with this more complicated model or more complex that's more appropriate for the data you actually have. So now the conversion difference is really important and really significant, really different from zero, and very likely that you have an increase in conversions when you work on weekends with the new variant and a decrease in conversions when you work, work during weekdays with the old variant, with the new variant, sorry. And you can translate that even to improvement percentage. You expect a 18% decrease in conversions by using the new variant during weekdays. Uh, you expect a 15% increase in conversions when you look at uh, weekends. And how does that translate into the optimal decision? You just compute how much utility, expected uplift, or expected loss, exactly the same way as before. And now you get different decisions that will be optimal based on different contexts. So you can have what's the best when you work during weekdays, use the old. What's the best when you work during weekends, use the new. And again, the data, you could identify different cohorts in the data and call this aggregating through time now instead of it just forget time but now you have different groups and you aggregate all of the observations and these cohorts might behave differently one could be more receptive to the new variant more receptive to the old variant and in this scenario the one of the cohorts is more receptive to the new variant another cohort is more receptive to the old variant so if you could do personalized targeting for personalized product placement then you know that you want to deploy the new variant to the one target audience and the old variant to the other target. And again, that can be translated into business logic with expected uplift, expected losses, uh, anything that's really tangible for stakeholders. And if you want, you can incorporate all of the structure into the model by saying, yes, we have uh, also time, we have the cohorts, and we might have even more complicated structure like trends, things that are slightly different. And for example, I just assume that you have different conversion rates per group and per day of, so if it's a business day or a weekend. And now what you learn, for example, is that you learn that there's really no difference for one of the variants during business days and one of the groups, almost, and, but the decrease when a decrease in conversions when you have uh, one of the uh, business days and another of the cohorts, uh, weekends and cohort A, but a super increase in conversions when you get weekends with another of the cohort. And this, again, represented in improvement percentages in conversions, you expect 53% increase in conversions for this group during weekends. So if you can do product placement that depends on time and depends on target audiences, you get to know what's the optimal decision for each of the segments of your audience. So basically wrapping up, what I've showed is uh, that PPLs apply to A-B tests, but they can really apply to many other business scenarios. So for example, in Parma, measure average treatment effect in preclinical studies or something that we're working very much on 
dragon that are called media mix models to allocate the budget of marketing across media channels in an optimal way so to in, to maximize the the number of conversions you get or the revenue that you get from the budget spent on marketing on you know channels like tv podcasts radio or whatever you can also have survival analysis in clinical trials, supply chain optimization, customer lifetime models, many, many scenarios. And it doesn't make sense to list them all because there are just so many. And there are some limitations of PPLs. And the most important limitation is that they are computationally complex because these automatic models, automatic inference engines require some, some uh, passes through the full data set there are some techniques to do approximations of the of the inference step something called variational inference uh, and which can be extended to more big data sets and then another limitation is that you m most likely or they're most suitable when you have observations that have a computable likelihood so so things that uh, there are some exceptions that can work with and uh, called approximate Bayesian computation, but I, I won't go into the details there. The most of the PPLs are suitable when you have the possibility to, to express the likelihood of your observation. And so basically that's it from my side. I thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, thanks, Luciana. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, we'll probably have Luciana right now here joining us for the Q&A session. Um, yes. Hello, Luciana. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Awesome to have you here. Are you joining from Italy? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, right. So we've got a one question on the Q&A tab from uh, Joanna. And Joanna asks, do you think that the probabilistic approach may in future make a greater impact on the existing methods used in business? Yes. So, so I just saw... Uh, since I had previously recorded, I was checking out the, the chat mm -hmm. and I just saw, I, I started writing and then got disconnected so I couldn't finish the reply. So yeah, uh, totally. There are some business areas that are completely oblivious to what they stand to gain if they incorporate probabilistic programming methods. Uh, one of our collaborators at PyMC Labs is working in insurance, for example. And in insurance set settings, you need to be able to do not only accurate forecasts, but you have to have a good credible interval of what you stand to gain what you stand to lose and there are situ certain situations that can lead to like catastrophic uh, losses in insurance so for example one of our one of the people that worked in the pymc ppl um, at one point was working in an insurance company that insured flights and so if there were one climatic event they led to not only one cancellation but many and then these due to graph structure of, of connections of flights between different airports also led to many failed flights in another airport. And so there were many claims to the insurer and you need to you needed to be able to account for the sort of the potential to lose all of this money because they could really leave the business bankrupt if they didn't account for this. And if you just target the most likely event or on average you don't really account for all of the diversity in the potential outcomes. And probabilistic programming uh, approaches naturally encode that. And so insurance was one of the main things. We're not working with that uh, at PyMC Labs at the moment. The, as I said, we're working with marketing and also with, with um, pharma. And pharma is huge. Uh, pharma uses most of the frequentist methods, uh, like maximum likelihood estimates. And the, the main drawback of those methods there is that you don't get uh, you don't get a good credible interval of the effect size of a drug or a treatment. And if you start to incorporate these other methods, you can get much more certainty in the estimates of, of treatment effects. So mm -hmm. yes, there are some businesses that are really aware of the existence and are are attempting to exploit all of these. Um, I've seen people on, on uh, that work for LinkedIn that use different PPL approaches to do their A-B testing, which has a lot of 
different challenges with respect to traditional ones due to all of the um, interactions between people uh, that can like leak effects of different tests from one target audience to another. So there's like huge challenges all around for, for everything and many opportunities in business setting. Um, mm -hmm. It's not so known for now. Yeah. Cool. We've got two new questions. One from Igor. Uh, how hard is it to properly choose correct distributions for the hidden variables? So usually, usually you start out by, by choosing the likelihood. So the ones that you do observe, you choose those kind of okay. And then for the hidden variables, there are some rules of thumb. Uh, the first thing is you say if the variable you know it has to be a positive thing. So for example, it's a variable that encodes noise uh, or variance, then uh, you need a distribution that only supports positive values. If you know it's a ratio or, or rate, like the conversion probabilities, you need to know that it should be bounded between zero and one. Another strange example, which I had to, uh, we had to work with was that things had to be on the surface of shell of a D-dimensional space. These are things that happen in, in NLP, natural language processing, that you need the distribution to have the support that's correct in this topology that's strange. And so usually when you look at these sorts of high level constraints of the support where you have to lie everything, then the choices of priors really uh, drop, like mm -hmm. uh, you, you can set them easier. easier. Then uh, the second question is once you choose the distribution, which parameters the distribution should take? And that's more subtle because uh, if you choose widely uninformative priors, those can uh, then in the likelihood space, like in the data space, lead to completely unrealistic observations. Um, and there's a nice post by one of our collaborators, Eric Ma, that, that relates this to Fermi paradox. Like if you want to estimate, if you want to estimate something in pharma, for example, and you know that it has to act at the cell level and it's a length scale of some binder of something, it doesn't make sense to set a flat prior for the length of this, because you know it, ha it can't be a galaxy long and it can't be less than a nanometer long. It, it has to be somewhere in biologically realistic realm. And so that helps you constrain the values of the prior. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And the last question from Michal. Uh, Luciana, firstly, Michal, thanks for the great talk. And uh, secondly, he asked a question, as prior input can be, as prior input, can we also use previous A-B test results? Yes. So, so that's one of the, uh, the most important questions. Like once you learn something, what can you use? What, how can you encode this into something? There are many different techniques. One of those is to uh, do some sort of interpolation of, of, the, of the posterior distribution that you learned from a previous A-B test that you ran. Uh, another is to just say, okay, this posterior seems to be like a beta with some set of parameters and then use that as the prior for the next run. But yeah, you can reuse, but the, the crucial thing is that there's assumption. What There are some hidden assumptions that usually no one pays attention to when you reuse things from the previous run, which is that you're assuming that things are exactly equivalent between two experiments. And there's some settings, like for instance, in physics, physical experiments where you measure the mass of a particle, you know that you're measuring exactly the same particle, the same mass. So if you do an experiment now or 100 years into the future, things won't have changed. But if you take this prior, uh, you, you use a posterior as a prior for a new thing, you're assuming that things haven't changed between the two. And so that can lead to some difficulties. And that's a subtle assumption. But the, the idea is that you can reuse. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. We've got one uh, question from Miho as well. Uh, if you don't mind, then, then we also, I'm going to also ask it. Um, Miho asks, according to the previous question about choosing distributions, uh, discrete methods heavily rely on our assumptions about inference graph, distributions, and so on. Do you think that such approaches are much more fragile compared to traditional A-B tests? No, because the A-B tests actually have exactly the same sorts of assumptions. But the thing is that the probabilistic programming framework, they um, make explicit 
explicitly known to everyone what are the assumptions that underlie things. So the traditional A-B tests usually say, I'll measure the distance between two things, and then I do a T-test. The T-test assumes normality. So, and, and then you have a bunch of more assumptions. And so then these assumptions are re really usually hidden and you'd start to uh, take them into account, like try to validate if the assumptions were correct or not. Um, so with probabilistic programming, it's just that you show your assumptions like at, at face value from the start. And that usually is harder for some stakeholders because stakeholders like black boxes that they say this works for everything. And uh, oh no, but you just assume that this was something different. So so it's kind of that's some one of the reasons that it's harder for stakeholders to adapt to basic programming methods. But the assumptions are there for both. The difference is that one tells you upfront which are the assumptions. The other you have to try to validate, and then get the results that you get are always kind mm -hmm. of strange. Awesome, awesome. Luciana, I think that concludes our Q&A session and generally your talk. Thanks for your contribution. And yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Awesome.